I was asked to give the talk on in hospital hyperglycemia. And I thought I'll narrow it down to something more specific as to the simple rules that we need to follow in inpatient care for a patient with diabetes. Because that's very important because, uh, you know, when you talk about in hospital uh, hyperglycemia, it covers a whole spectra of people. Now, let me sort of make my point clear that when patients come in non-ICU setting, they can be with varied diagnosis. You have one end of the spectrum where a patient is a little more sick. So here's a patient where, you know, the diagnosis was heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. She was a 65-year-old female with diabetes, admitted shortness of breath, X-ray showed fluid overload, ejection fraction was 40%. And treatment till date, prior to admission, the patient was on sedagliptin 100 milligram per day. And labs were, of course, blood glucose 167, A1C of 6.8, and EGFR of 52 per minute. So clearly, you can see that this was a fairly well-controlled patient. Uh, on the other hand, you have another patient with diabetic foot ulcer, presence of cellulitis. This is a 38-year-old male with diabetes, admitted diabetic foot ulcer and cellulitis of the right foot. Patients' prior admission uh, treatment was on metformin one gram twice a day, and glargine 24 units at bedtime. Here, the patient's labs were blood glucose of 311, A1C of 10.2, and a normal EG, uh, EGFR of 68. So clearly, you can see one is a controlled patient, the other one is an uncontrolled patient, both coming with different diagnoses. And obviously, our approach to treatment for both is going to be a little different. But the bottom line is both of them are going to require insulin therapy at the time of hospitalization. So given this, my first premise is that never that miss the diagnosis us. of diabetes at the yeah, time of Okay, so this is a paper by Dr. Umpia Raj. And what they looked at was all patients randomly who came to the hospital. They were about in the, in the paper 2000 odd patients where they diagnosed hyperglycemia as a fasting blood glucose of more than or equal to 126 and a random glucose of more than or equal to 200. Mind you that these were not established patients with diabetes. And what they did find out in this random you know, analysis of patients who came to the hospital, that 62% of the people were had normal glycemia, 26% had prior diagnosis of diabetes, but 12% found out that they have uh, diabetes for the first time during the hospitalization. Now, since the uh, A1C was not done, uh, in these patients, we did not know that were they misdiagnosis or uh, hyperglycemia we developed during the hospitalization period. But what is important to understand is if you miss the diagnosis of diabetes during hospitalization, the re-hospitalization rates are almost four times as much. So never ever sort of miss the diagnosis of diabetes during hospitalization because invariably these patients are going to come back to you with another problem and they will probably require recurrent hospitalizations. Also, as a, in the same paper, that if you look at the in-hospital mortality rate in patients with normal glycemia, it's 1.7%, but patients who had a history of diabetes, it was 3%. But if you look at patients who were newly diagnosed hyperglycemia, the rates of mortality were almost again about five times as much. Now, this is understandable because patients who develop new onset hyperglycemia during hospitalization always reflects a very sick patient. And these ten patients tend to develop a stress hyperglycemia. So the mortality rates are higher than patients who develop hyperglycemia, who already have a history of diabetes. So remember that any patient who are normal glycemic becomes hyperglycemic at hospitalization. It's an indicator or a surrogate marker of severity of the disease itself. And I'll just extend my point that here, if you look at this paper, which looked at about 3,000 odd patients, non-cardiac surgery patients, and they looked at the 30-day mortality and hospital complications in patients who had diabetes and non-diabetes who underwent a non-cardiac surgery, you can clearly see the post-operative complication rates were higher in patients who had diabetes. Now, look at this again, another patient who, you know, they looked at perioperative event rates in patients who developed hyperglycemia and they'll compare patients who had diabetes versus no diabetes. You can clearly see here that patients who developed a hyperglycemia 
postoperatively in a normal glycemic patients had a higher event rates as compared to patients who had established diabetes. So clearly, you can see here that new onset hyperglycemia is always more sinister and indicates a more severity of the disease process. My second premise is that you always need to keep your patients safe. Now, you can see in this paper by Dr. Tony Finario, who is a cardiac surgeon, and they looked at the reasons for patients who did bad in the post-operative period. And you can see here that post-operative mortality, as well as incidences of deep sternal wound infections, were higher as the blood glucose in the post-operative state was, you know, it went upwards. But what they did find is that if you look at the post-operative mortality in patients who had a glucose level of less than 200 versus more than 200 in the first post-op day, you can see here that patients who are hyperglycemic in the first post-op day had a higher mortality as compared to patients whose blood glucose was less than 200. Now, if you have anybody with a first post-op day glucose of more than 200, it increases the length of stay by two times ventilation duration by three times and mortality incidences by seven times. So what it does tell you is the fact that you need to get aggressive and aggressive early enough to see that you bring your patient's blood glucose down to acceptable levels so that you can prevent post-operative morbidity and mortality. Now, this was again a, the most landmark paper by Vandenberg, the Lewine study, and they had two subgroup of people where they said that what should be your ideal blood glucose target rates to prevent any post-op, uh, 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 preventing post-operative morbidity and mortality. And they compared intensively treated patients versus conventionally treated patients. The target blood glucose in intensive patients was between 80 to 110, and in conventional was 180 to 200, and they were insulinized when the blood glucose targets were more than 200. Clearly, you can see here that patients who had an intensive targets had lower incidences of mortality, bacteremia, need for antibiotics, prolonged ventilation, dialysis, or for that matter, ICU hospital stay. This study actually became a landmark study because after this, patient uh, doctors across the you know, intensive world started waking up to the fact that they need to look at blood glucose targets more aggressively. And obviously, there was an era when everybody started targeting the blood glucose targets between 80 and 110. This was also sort of, you know, validated by a number of other studies, which you can see here that the, when the patients were intensified in their outcomes, the rates of infection mortality were all lower in the intensively treated patients. But what it really signaled was that, you know, when, or when you go down that low, the incidences of hypoglycemia tend to increase. And these patients tended to have a higher mortality and morbidity secondary to hypoglycemia. So there was obviously a reason that should all patients be targeted to 80 to 110 or can we keep them to higher targets? And I think the NICE sugar study kind of uh, more or less settled the issue when they said that there was really no benefit, clear benefit in targeting patients between 80 to 110. And now, of course, we accept the fact that most of our patients in ICU settings should be kept between 140 to 180. But the ACE guidelines had a caveat that patients in post-surgical uh, state should be targeted between 80 to 110. But then the subsequent trial, glucose EBG trial came in, which looked at 80 to 110 versus 140 to 180, and they found no clear difference. And now, of course, we accept the fact that all patients should be kept between 140 to 180. Now, what about non-critical care settings? What should be your target goals be? And you can see here that the pre-meal blood glucose should be less than 140, and random blood glucose or post-meal glucose target should be less than 180 in majority of the patients. As I said, that for patients in ICU, the target goal should be between 140 to 180. Glycemic target should be modified as per the clinical status. For terminally ill patients, you can clearly keep them to higher goals for those who are at risk for hypoglycemia, you need to target them to, you know, more safety levels. And you should always try and avoid keeping them below 100. Uh, my next premise is that all patients who are hospitalized should be kept on insulin. Now, there is a caveat to this, that patients who come in for short stays, for example, you know, patients with cataract surgery or daycare surgeries, where you're going to have one missed meal, these patients need not be converted to insulin therapy and you can continue them on the oral therapies if they have been well controlled. 
But majority of the patients, when they come into hospital for longer stays, should be recommended insulin therapy. And oral, oral agents as a means for control is generally not recommended. Now, when you have patients in hypoglycemic crisis, uncontrolled severe hypoglycemia or in ICU settings, we prefer to keep them on IV insulin. Whereas in patients who are relatively stable, non-critical, non-ICU settings, we can advocate for them subcutaneous insulin therapy. We had come out from the RSSDA, the inpatient hypoglycemia guidelines, where we had put forth the algorithm of how to manage the in, uh, IV insulin therapy. And you can see here the charts which we have recommended. And I would recommend you to see the, uh, the paper which we presented from the RSSDI which has this entire sort of algorithm listed out. So you need to give a priming bolus, infusion rates have been outlined, uh, how to do the rate adjustments, they've all been clearly outlined. And if patients tend to develop hypoglycemia, how do you manage them? So in interest of time, I'm not really going to repeat what is mentioned over here, but clearly we have an algorithm based, uh, you know, approach to how do you manage uh, IV insulin therapy. Now, once a patient is stable and you want to move them to subcutaneous insulin therapy, we shift them onto a basal bolus therapy with the correction boluses if they're not at goals. So ultimately, the patient needs a basal prandial insulin and a correction bolus, which sort of gives you the total insulin requirements. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we can do a correction of 10% or 20% based on how the glycemic status is in the entire day, you can go up if the patient's entire day's blood glucose is not very good, and you can add on 10% or 20% depending on the entire day's glucose values. But if the patient was too tightly controlled getting hypoglycemic spells, then you need to reduce by 10% or 20% the total daily requirement, and then recalibrate the next day's insulin uh, requirements. <clears throat> Remember that when the patient come in, in a non-critical care set setting, you discontinue oral agents. If the patient is insulin naive, then depending on the weight status, you can give 0.3 to 0.5 units per kilogram per day. And you can sort of go up if the patient is obese. If the patient is sick or, you know, very asthenic, uh, you can give them lower doses or at a risk for hypoglycemia. Then you can give them 0.1 to 0.3 units per kilogram per day. You give starting lower doses in the elderly and renal insufficient patients. Now, whatever the calculated insulin therapy is, if the patients were already on insulin, you reduce the outpatient insulin dose by 20 to 25%, and then you calibrate the basal and the bolus dose requirements. Uh, generally, we give half the total dose as basal and half equally divided as rapid acting insulin before meals. Now, I'm just going to come to different sort of, you know, insulin regimes that we tend to use. Uh, one of the things is always sort of, can we give sliding scale with regular insulin to our patients? And this pa paper, the RABBIT2 study, which was done in the surgical patients, they looked at giving basal bolus with insulin analogs versus four times a day sliding scale insulins. What they did find was that the fasting glucose, the mean daily daytime glucose levels, were higher in patients who had a sliding scale uh, versus the patients who were on basal boluses. And also the, they had a higher glycemic variability in patients who were given sliding scales. Although the hypoglycemia rates were not really very different, but the patient did not have a good ideal control in the sliding scale. So most of us now for subcutaneous insulin do not follow the sliding scale rule. We tend to give the basal bolus, and then, of course, we titrate the requirements of the insulin as per the algorithm. Uh, you also see here that patients who are on sliding scale had a higher sort of, you know, of morbidity and mortalities in terms of composite uh, outcomes, mortality rates, wound infections, pneumonias, and acute renal failures. So by and large, patients who are on basal bolus therapy do much better than patients who are given a sliding scale. Now, what about do all patients require insulin analogs? And we already always had the conventional insulins, and they looked at basal bolus in regime with analogs versus NPH and regular insulin. And you can clearly see here when these two groups were compared, the glycemic control was very similar between the two groups. But what was different was the fact the hypoglycemia rates. So if you see the hypoglycemia between analogs and insulins, 
the analogs had lower rates of hypoglycemia as compared to the human insulins. So this is a clear advantage. Uh, with, so for between the two groups, regular insulin versus analog insulin, for patients who are at a higher risk for hypoglycemia or very sick patients or for those who have altered mentation, clearly analog insulins are favored because of the low risk of hypoglycemia. Can we give premixed insulins to our patients in the hospital setting? And this was a study which compared sort of basal bolus versus premixed insulin. And you can clearly see here that the glycemic control is fairly similar between premixed insulin versus basal bolus. But what is different is again the hypoglycemia rates at any point of time of the day between the basal bolus and premix. The hypoglycemia was higher in the premix group. Again, the glycemic variability was higher in premix groups. And we know that both these parameters can have a lot of influence in the outcome of the patient. So by and large, in hospitalized setting, we do not prefer premix insulin. Also is the fact that when you give premix insulin, you don't have too much of flexibility for dose titrations as per the meal or the timing of the meal. So, you know, it is easier to put them on basal bolus where you can sort of, you know, titrate the mealtime glucose values with regular, with the analog, uh, short-acting analog insulins because we at times are not predictive of what time the patient may eat or the quantity of meal that the patient may consume. So it is much better to put the patient on basal bolus as compared to premixed insulins. Uh, if you have to look at Primarily oral agents. Now, can we give oral agents in our patients with, uh, you know, who are hospitalized? And they looked at, uh, this paper looked at how many patients were basically on oral agents during the hospitalization. And you can see at the distribution that 72% of our patients in hospitalized setting were on basal bolus. 4% were on oral plus basal, but 24% of the patients were managed on only oral agents. Now, this was basically random analysis of uh, the hospital where they looked at if across the board, when they looked at all the prescriptions in the hospitalized patients, how many patients were already on only steady oral agents. Uh, so the point came is that do all patients require uh, insulin? Or can we give oral agents in the hospitalized patient? And does it have advantage to use oral agents? Now, this was a paper which looked at basically use of DPP-4 inhibitors. They had three subgroups. One group had only citagliptin. Second group had citagliptin plus glargine. And third group was basal, basal bolus uh, with, you know, glargine and Lispro. What you can see clearly out here that patients who had a citagliptin plus basal combination, the overall total daily dose insulin requirement was lower in these patients as compared to patients who are on only, uh, only on basal bolus or only on insulin. Also, the number of injections that the patient required per day, whether you look at basal or whether you look at even Crandall plus uh, DPP-4, were more or less similar in the two groups. So what they did conclude was that if you give citagliptin plus basal in not very sick patients, you may still get an advantage where you may require lesser amounts of insulin to be given with lower rates of hypoglycemia and the number of injections may not really go up. And that may sort of give you a bit clear advantage as compared to a patient who gets more number of injections in a day. This was also looked at besides citagliptin with linagliptin, where you found that how are the blood glucose levels, the daily blood glucose levels in the two groups? And you find that patients in less than 200 versus those who had more than or equal to 200 were very similar in the two groups. And if you look at the hypoglycemia rates, they were lower in the patients who were linagliptin, who had linagliptin as compared to those who were only on uh, insulin therapies. This was also looked at patients who were on saxagliptin. And you can clearly see here, uh, that the blood glucose were much lower in the saxagliptin group and the total amount of insulin that were required were lower in the patients who received saxagliptin plus basal therapies. I come to the last premise that uh, uh, what are the transition principles that we need to follow when changing from intravenous to subcutaneous insulins? Because very often when patients are admitted in the critical care settings, you, do, you give IV insulins in patients in the critical care but when you're transferring the patient onto the ward areas, you need to transition them onto subcutaneous insulin. 
And there are certain clear rules that you need to follow for the transition process. Continue IV insulin until the patient is able to tolerate solid food intake. Continue IV insulin at least two hours after the first subcutaneous insulin injection is given. And this is the most common mistake that has happened when you give the order to transfer the patient. You, most often than not, in the ICUs, what happens is the patient, the IV insulin is stopped and then the subcutaneous insulin is given. So they're almost about you know one hour to one and a half hours time before the subcutaneous insulin effect kicks in. And you find that you know there is a time when the patient suddenly tends to become hyperglycemic. So you need to give the subcutaneous insulin first and then shut off the IV insulin. Don't use only basal insulin when the A1C is greater than 8.5 on two or more oral agents. Don't switch to oral agents from IV and effective insulin therapy must provide both basal and nutritional coverage. Uh, is there an advantage when you give IV insulin between, you know, uh, insulin analogs versus regular insulin? And this was a DK trial, which looked at that, you know, they compared IV insulin analogs versus human insulin. And they will have to conclude fast, please. Yeah, next one minute only. So you find that there is no difference in the resolution rates when you give analogs versus regular insulin and clearly there is no benefit but when they are transitioned to subcutaneous then there is an advantage of lower hypoglycemic rates. Uh, just last point that discharge recommendation for patients who are already on you know patients well controlled diabetes you go back to the original prescription but patients who are uncontrolled at the time of you know hospitalization then these patients it's a point to sort of get aggressive and it's a point to sort of intensify treatment and patients who are previously diagnosed intensify treatment patients who are previously undiagnosed but diagnosed for the first time look at the agency values and then decide and patients who develop stress hyperglycemia you need to maintain a close follow-up because 30 percent of these patients may eventually tend to develop diabetes uh I'll conclude by saying that hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for poor clinical outcome. Tight glycemic control improves mortality and morbidity. We do not know what the optimum glycemic goals should be. Hospitalization is an opportunity to assess glycemic control and intensify outpatient therapy. The barriers to good control is a gap between what we know and what we do. A privilege to know Dr. Umpiraz, who's probably done the largest amount of work in the hospital environment. And this is a tribute to his. Thank you very much.